Hello and welcome to Connect FCS Ed Podcast, where we talk about family and consumer sciences education. Each episode is geared to recruit, support, and retain the professional FCS educator. I am your host, Barbara Scully, and I want to help boldly celebrate families and careers with you. Hi, and welcome back to Connect FCS Ed. This week, I have an amazing FCS teacher. She is a singleton out of Yellow Springs, Ohio. She's a singleton, so much of you can understand. And she teaches five preps. Amazing teacher. Welcome, Anna Hall. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yes. No, thank you for taking the time and just joining and just sharing, I guess, all FCS awesomeness that you're doing in your area. So share a little bit about yourself. Yeah. So I am in my fourth year as an FCS teacher. Just like me. (laughs) I am a transplant into this profession. I actually went to college with the hope of becoming a teacher. And in my first few meetings with my advisor, I told her that I wanted to be a home ec teacher. And she told me that that was no way that was going to happen in the state of Ohio, that they were not currently giving people licenses for family and consumer science in our state, which I think was a lie, but I'm, I don't know. Um, <laughs> So I ended up getting an education degree and going on to graduate school in college administration. And I worked in college admin for a few years, got kind of burnt out of that and became a long-term substitute teacher, um, which led me to pursue an alternative license in FCS. And I am so happy that I have found this job. I love it. I wake up every day happy to work with my students. I love the content area. I love the other professionals and I'm very happy to be here. It interconnects with life, and that's what I absolutely love about our content. It it meets everybody where they're at and helps them learn more. So that's that's my favorite. I love it, and I think that's really cool that you were in college um, administration. That's that's a really cool (laughs) area. And (laughs) how did I guess how did that happen? I was really involved in my college and decided to go off to graduate school for that. I actually was the house mom for a fraternity for three years at the University of Maryland. So it was me as a graduate student and 50 underclassmen men living in one house together. (laughs) And then I worked in residence life at some colleges for a little while. So I lived in campus housing for 10 years. Well, I bet the stories you could say. <laughs> yes. That is fun. So now that you're an FCS teacher, are you virtual, hybrid, face to face? We are mostly face to face. Our county is experiencing a lot of cases right now of COVID, and we actually had a huge surge. Um, among teachers and students at our school. So we had to close for two weeks and be remote and we are headed back to in-person tomorrow. Okay. So are you wearing masks, face shields? How are your classes set up? We are wearing masks, socially distancing whenever possible. When I'm doing labs, it's one person in a kitchen at a time. So every student has a day of the week that they're cooking and that that is their day. And if they miss it, they miss their lab for the week. And we're just having a flux in our student rosters. Like we're seeing students leaving to go to a virtual option that we have every day. So every day I'm losing students, it seems like. Yeah. So how many, gosh, okay. So with you mentioning that one student in the kitchen, so Mm -hmm. is your, is your classroom, is it set up where you have a kitchen and a classroom all in one room? Yes. You can, okay. So you can supervise them cooking and being able to give direction. Okay. Because I was thinking, oh, do you have a para professional or yeah. How, how does this work? Because I was, I was like, wait a minute, this is a, a new way. I've, I have not heard of this. So the logistics are complicated and it's really less cooking and more food prep and instruction following. They're not doing 
as intense of labs as they would be doing just because I'm split and there's one person and there's just a lot of logistical things to do yeah. with. So how, how many students do you have in? So on a normal, normal situation, pre COVID, how many students did you have in one classroom? 24. 24. Okay. So actually that's very similar to, for me, for my foods classes, we had a cap of 24 students and um, because we have six home style kitchens. So only four, four students per kitchen. Um, And it was capped at 24 for safety reasons and all. Yeah. So I'm very similar setup. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, All right. So for your classes, are you in, so with face-to-face and you're losing students almost daily to virtual learning, Mm -hmm. how are you pivoting from that face-to-face to that virtual learning setup? What are you doing to, for your curriculum, I guess, are you, what are you creating? How are you making things engaging? Yeah, so I've actually, from day one, been doing as much as I can in Google Classroom, which is our learning management system that we use, just so that if we had to switch to remote, it would be an easy transition, which I think a lot of us are doing that. And so it also helps me when I have one student, you know, in each kitchen and everyone else is working. So basically, I'm giving them multiple assignments in Google Classroom every week, and then they are responsible for completing those on the days that they're not in their labs. So it's very similar for at-home learning. Um, I've been really getting into the interactive notebooks that seem to be super popular right now. Um, I created one for um, the Serve Safe Food Handler exam. So we worked through that, and that's a fun and engaging way to use the curriculum with online, but then also when we're face-to-face, we can talk about what they're doing in their notebooks and do some add-on activities and things. Yeah, I mean, just trying to create interactive worksheets and finding engaging activities. It's, it's hard. It's so hard to pivot to teaching online, but well, I absolutely agree with you. It being that it's hard, it is hard. There's no denying that, mm-hmm. but I don't know about you, but I'm finding that I am becoming a better teacher because of this, Mm -hmm. because I'm able to really focus on my standards. Not that I wasn't focusing on our standards by any means, because I was, but I feel like I've been able to cut out so much fat in our face-to-face curriculum that we were doing to move things into this virtual environment where my students are getting like all of the meat within our assignments. And yeah, my classes, my foods classes, there's no cooking. So I'm not able to send out any like pre-made food kits or anything like that. Cause I know there's a lot of districts uh, or a lot of teachers who have been able to make you know food kits for their students for single servings, which I'm extremely you know jealous, <laughs> but that they're able to do that. But at the same time, I am able to kind of get down to the why, for why we're doing things a certain way. We're able to focus, like I'm going into measure. So I'm only going into unit three right now of my, in a trimester. I don't know about, are you on trimesters or semesters? We're on semesters. We're on semesters. Yeah, I'm able, so I only have students for 12 weeks. We're going into what, week nine or something like that. And my students are, we're just getting into unit three of measuring and reading a recipe that (laughs) I'm I'm like, we have, I don't know how many, we have like six or seven standards and, and I'm only on three and I'm like, and we're not going to be able to get to the nutrition part. We're not going to be able to get to the careers unit. We're not going to be able to get to so many different areas, but I'm able to take things slower. And then I feel like I'm going to be able to set my foods to kids up better because we're able to focus on the measuring part longer and really Mm -hmm. help them understand how to do equivalents and break, you know, fractions down, how to double a recipe, how to reduce those types of things. 
Those are challenging topics in my classes. <laughs> I'm finding that those are some of the hardest things to teach. So if you're really hitting the measuring, that sounds great. Yeah. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I'm So just like you, I'm now creating digital interactive notebooks. I'm really impressed with myself, honestly. Like after I'm done compiling them, I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And drop and drags and I, my platform, I'm a Microsoft school district. So I use Microsoft teams for my LMS. It's not an L it's not an LMS by any means, but that's what we're calling it these days. Fine. I'm jealous that you're, you're Google, all of you listening who have our Google school districts, be grateful for what you have. (laughs) (laughs) So how did you come about to doing digital interactive notebooks? Like what spurred you on to going down that route? I mean, this summer, I just felt like I needed to do something to prepare when I had absolutely no idea. We weren't told what our school district plan was until about a week before school was supposed to start. So I figured if I just jumped on the interactive notebook bandwagon. It would keep me busy. Like I was setting myself up for success, but I didn't have to know if we were going to be remote or in person. Yeah. Where are you getting this, these extra ideas from? Is there a Instagram account or is there a teacher pay teacher that you are following or a Facebook group? Well, a lot of the ones that you mentioned in last week's episode on great Facebook resources, I was just nodding my head along saying, oh yeah, yes, 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 yes. These are fabulous. So of course the national FCS teacher Facebook group has been great. There's an interactive notebook group for FCS educators. Forget what the name of that one is. We have an Ohio group for FCS educators. And then I follow a lot of teachers on Um, YouTube. Like I love watching all their videos of creating new stuff, especially pocket full of primary, even though she's primary education, still love her stuff. And she was talking about some different interactive online tools this summer. And that got me really interested in learning more. All right. So this, it's a YouTube channel. It's called Mm -hmm. pocket full of primary. Yes. Okay. Well, I just wrote it down on my little scratch paper here to go look her up and, you know, save it to my, my, my repertoire, because I don't know about you. I love, I'm on my computer 24 seven. My kids feel like, you know, I'm a fixture in the living room where my desk is, but I love seeing and watching what everybody else is doing and hearing what everybody else is doing. And there's, I swear, I think COVID, there's a silver lining with COVID. And that is, we have been able to break away from our norm and to think outside of the box when it comes to creating our own meaningful professional learning communities. That's going to actually engage us and help us think more critically of what we are doing for our students and improving our own teaching or teacher professional development. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I think that, you know, it's really encouraged us to reach out to more people and to develop a lot of skills with people who are FCS educators or are totally different content areas because we're all in the same boat right now. And we all can share resources and ideas, even if it's not content area specific, which I am finding really cool. Yeah. And just like sharing the pocket full of primary, that YouTube channel, I'm sure she's going to drop some amazing stuff that I can take into my own classroom and like, oh, I'm going to pull this because this was, I think this is beneficial for everybody. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, think outside of the box, I think is the best way, just because it's not FCS or CTE related doesn't mean that you can't pull a nugget from the gold mine, I could say. Yes. Yeah. So what, I guess, what topic are you in with, or what unit are you in with foods right now? Well, <laughs> that's a little bit complicated. 
frustrated because I sort of switched gears when my students went home and I'm going to be picking up again tomorrow with more on reading recipes and measurement. I was one of those very fortunate people that was able to get my students cooking kits while we've been home the last two weeks. Oh, and I just went on that tangent. (laughs) I, I actually, well, I need to spend my money. That's my problem. I have budget money. And if I am way under on my budget, then they won't give me as much money for next year. So my plan is to try and spend as much money as I can from my current budget. So I made up cooking kits and spent two days driving around to all my students and dropping off food. So they've actually been able to cook a lot the last two weeks while they've been home. And it's been pretty successful, (laughs) even though we haven't really gone over all the measuring and things. So now we're going to backpedal and hopefully really hit that hard. Well, gosh, I think that's, so I'm just thinking about this. You're giving them, you're giving your students the space to learn how to do something on their own. And then you're able to go in and kind of backpedal, like you said, and say, what went well and what didn't? Yes, that is my big question for tomorrow. Yes. What went well and what didn't? And I don't know, most of our learning experiences are by failure. And failure is a good thing because it is a learning experience. Mm-hmm. We all could say that we've had some sort of awesome learning experience when it comes to cooking, right? Mm-hmm. So, okay, so you're you're gonna say, okay, what what did we learn, and what or no, not say what did we learned. What was the most challenging aspect of cooking from cooking at home? And mm-hmm. they will. <laughs> At least say my food, my recipe didn't turn out right. I didn't have the right stuff because it didn't taste well. Well, Mm -hmm. did you follow the recipe, right? Well, yeah. One of the things that they made was Play Doh, and then they had to send me photos. And there were at least two students whose photos didn't even look close to Play Doh. Like, (laughs) so I'm very interested to see what might have happened. Yes. Very watery. Yeah. I wonder like, oh, what, what did these uh, pictures look like? Did they end up looking like, oh gosh, what is like the goop, like slime? Yes. Ah. Yes. They looked very much like that. But it's been so cool. Some of the kids are stylizing their photos and, you know, finding the perfect plate and location for the sun to hit it. And some students are sending process photos and then some kids are just sending like a blurry picture, you know, that they took right away. So it's fun to see their ownership of their work. (laughs) Exactly. So do you use like Flipgrid or any other video messaging app through your school district? No, I've just been using Loom. They had a free thing for teachers. So I was able to get a free account where we can make like longer videos. We don't not restricted to that five minutes. And so I've just been taking videos of myself using Loom or screen videos, like screen casted videos. Mm -hmm. So for my child development class, I'm doing some more of those than I am with the culinary or walking them through different technology resources. So how to take a picture, like I can do that where I'm sharing the screen, but they can also see me. Yeah. So, well, you just mentioned that you have a child development class. So what, what are you doing there? Oh, we're going to be talking about childbirth tomorrow. My absolute favorite. <laughs> oh, I love it. So, uh, yes. So please pray tell. Tell me, how are you going to walk through this unit? Well, we've been doing prenatal development. So this week, we are going to be talking about childbirth. We learn about all the different options for childbirth. And we sometimes have really great speakers coming in, but obviously, you know, things are a little different this year. I was hoping that we could get a video tour of one of our local hospitals, but it doesn't seem like that's going to be possible. I thought I was very excited about that possibility. But we're going to do an activity that I've learned on here with you use the balloon and a ping pong ball from yes. the Facebook group. Yes, I love that activity. The kids find it awesome. It's a great way to talk about dilation and what the purpose is of contractions. 
And so for those who aren't familiar, you put a ping pong ball inside of a balloon that's not blown up. You then blow it up. And instead of tying it, you kind of shuffle it around till the ping pong ball sits at the very bottom where the air would come out. And students have to push on the balloon and to get the ping pong ball to shoot out. Yes. I did that with my child development class four years ago in my first classroom. And that was by far the most amazing lesson that we did. Students wanted to continue doing that for a couple of days after we, they were still talking about it because they were just amazed going just by trying to quickly push on the blown up balloon to try to make the ping pong ball pop out. It had to go through a series of contractions in order to make its way down. They talked about that for several days after we had done that lesson. So it, it's a good one. And I felt so lucky two years ago, my supervisor just happened to come for my Absolutely. surprise observation on the day that we did that. And he was so blown away. He was like, number one, you're using the word vagina so comfortably that I'm <laughs> not really sure how to take it. And number two, like, this is so cool. <laughs> that is Awesome. I So I work with three other really cool FCS teachers in my building. And uh, Miss Rhodes, she teaches our early childhood education and or ECE and ch- uh, human development. And oh, gosh, she loves saying vagina and penis all day. She's so comfortable with it. I'm comfortable with it. Like, I I just, we just said it all (laughs) over over the mic, but it is, it is so fun. And she's just, and she's just always in any conversation, she drops, you know, body parts, (laughs) just like as if it's nothing. And then everybody's just jaw drop. Like, did we just hear what we think we heard? Yes, (laughs) we did. (laughs) I love it. I love it. So what other classes are you teaching? I am teaching intro to family and consumer science and a baking course, which technically baking and pastry arts is not a course in Ohio, but it's a, I forget what the actual, it's like an advanced foods class, but I'm making it a baking class for the school. It's my first time teaching it and it has been a lot of fun. We are learning about quick breads right now. And so we are going to start the process for Amish friendship bread tomorrow. Ooh, so are you going to be doing the starter? Yes. Ooh, if you can, send me a starter. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I'm excited to see them experience that process. I think it'll be really fun to watch. That will be. And so what do you do for Intro to Family Consumer Sciences? Because that's not a class that I have ever... I've heard of it, but I don't know what it entails. I've done it different every year. I just got the name officially changed for my school. So like in our course catalog, it's going to be adult living, which I think is a better name and helps students just understand it better. But it's really a survey course, like an overview. There are so many standards that we're supposed to hit, which makes it very difficult. But I sort of just break it down into units of different topics that we would talk about in other family consumer science classes as like a preview or, you know, to get them excited Mm -hmm. about hopefully taking future classes. Right now we are talking about careers, but also utilizing different Google apps and technology platforms to search for jobs and create like a resume and all those things, just because I'm also trying to teach them how to better utilize the Google apps that we're doing in class. So we're yeah. in all classes right now. Okay. So it sounds, it sounds similar to, so my first year I taught, it was a, uh, it's, it was called life on your own. So mm-hmm. it sounds very similar and yeah, there's lots of standards, which we broke down into different units so there's the the financial unit, the mm-hmm. paying taxes and looking for a house and doing the car comparison. Do you have like a junior achievement close to you? No. No. Have you heard of junior achievement by chance? No, I have not. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, well, junior achievement, I don't know if so look them up, but they are a nationwide program 
where they, gosh, they partner with local businesses and they create like for the elementary age kids, it's called biz town. And then for on like the other side, the, for the older kids, it's a financial analysis type class and where you could do, they can partner with you as the teacher and they could send you units within the financial side, how to do a car comparison shopping. Oh, they'll give you a real, uh, a real life scenario where you're possibly, you're a single mom, you have $17,000 in student loan debt. Your kid is six years old. They give you a, like a real life scenario. And then your kids, they could be grouped up into two, three, four person groups or individual. And you are trying to navigate how to get out of whatever situation that it's given you. So I think it's really cool. So look up Junior Achievement. JA, I think is their uh, acronym or abbreviation. And um, see if they can, they could just uh, kind of partner with you. And they give out scholarships and uh, for students, they help partner you as a teacher. And they come in, they could also even come in to your classroom if they're close enough. So I, wow, that sounds like a great resource. Yeah, I highly recommend that they are a national program. So see if there's a junior achievement, you know, close by you that maybe they can help give you extra support in any sort of way. Thank you. That sounds great. I'm definitely going to look into that because I'm always looking. I mean, we all are, you know, to partner with lots of different people in the area. Yeah. So I moved from gosh, the area that I grew up in my entire life over to Eastern Washington two years ago. And I now have, I have very little career contacts. I'm starting to gain more. I'm starting to get to know more people, but it's hard. I had contacts beyond, I was able to say, oh, I want so-and-so to come into my classroom. I'd contact them. They're like, oh yeah, I'd love to come in and talk about what I do for my career and partner with you in any sort of way. Now I don't have that. And so it's hard. How are you going out and contacting local support to come in to talk to your students? How do you do that? Well, a couple different ways. So number one, just obviously networking. So the people that I know, asking them who they know. And also, I have been trying to partner with local restaurants and other food industry businesses. So at the start of the school year, I send out letters to, you know, last year, I think I sent out like 70 letters to different restaurants and other businesses in the area, introducing myself and asking if they were interested in partnering um, to help support my foods related students in one of three ways. So one way was to help sponsor students to take the Serve Safe Food Handler certification test. One way was to come in and be a guest speaker in the class. And the third way was to allow students to come and do a field trip and see behind the scenes at their business. And this was a great success. We got a lot of money donated to us. I formed some really great partnerships with local businesses. And it just feels like such a great way to be involved. And people would say, oh my gosh, like I'm an alumni of Fairborn High School and I'm so excited that I can do this and give back or saying, I didn't even know they still had cooking classes. We would love to hire your students. You know, it's just so cool. And I've been able to have some different restaurants come in and do open interviews during our lunch periods. My planning period coincides with our lunch. So it's an hour and a half of time where they can come in and set up in my classroom, which is right next to the cafeteria. When students are done eating, they can come in and do interviews. And I just think it's a, it's a win-win. Like my students are winning because they're providing money or these opportunities for my classroom. But then these businesses are winning because they're getting students with great references who have kitchen experience and have passed the food handler certification test in. It's been a great way to build up partnerships for me. I love that. Well, and also for giving back, students are able to see that they have other caring adults who who are interested in them. 
and yeah. which makes them rise to a much higher level when it mm-hmm. comes to you know meeting that that baseline they're exceeding that because all of a sudden oh my gosh i need to put on a good impression these are not my parents not my family not my teachers or administration this is potential future so mm-hmm. they rise i know they do every single time Yes, but I highly encourage everyone to just reach out to your local businesses because they're so excited about the opportunity, you know? I mean, there were a lot of people I didn't hear back from, but the people that I did hear back from were just had just been waiting t- for me to contact them, you know? <laughs> yes, yes. Oh, I love it. No, oh. and so, gosh, okay. So human development, mm-hmm. intro to family consumer sciences, we got your baking and pastry class. You have your foods class. Mm-hmm. What is your fifth class? I teach global foods, but mm-hmm. I'm not teaching that right now this semester, that which has been semester. fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So with global foods, is that where you kind of go uh, do a trip around the world and being able to focus on different cuisines and cultures? Yes, exactly. Ah. How are you thinking you're going to teach that? Second semester. (laughs) I'm going to wait and see what the world looks like second semester. We started late this year. We ended up pushing our start date back. So second semester won't start till the very end of January. I'm just hoping that some of the protocols for our county will change because hopefully our number of cases will go down. I'm just going to believe that that will happen. (laughs) That's what we're all hoping for. We're hoping (laughs) for a normal second semester, third trimester. (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Well, what other awesome things are you, do you have going on? Are you doing anything on the side? Are you facilitating any PLCs for your district or or just yourself? What are you doing to enhance your own learning? Oh, well, I'm, To enhance my own learning, I'll tell you that. And then I'll tell you a professional development thing that I've been leading that I love. For myself, I actually am a member of ACTE, which is the National Career Tech Association. And they had a thing out this month and people can still apply until I think it's November 2nd to be in a mentorship program that focuses on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the CTE classroom. And so I have applied to be a mentee and I'm very excited about this. Can't wait to get paired up with someone. We'll do some reading on different topics and go to some sessions some virtual sessions and do some writing on the topic. So I'm very excited to talk about equity in CTE classes and think that that's going to be a really cool opportunity. I hope that it ends up being as great as I think it's going to be. Yeah, I just think it's something we really need to be talking about. So I don't know. I have I have a lot of interest there. But something that I have been doing the past couple years in my district, and now I'm going to be leading a session for Ohio FCS teachers, is talking about how I utilize cookie decorating classes with other teachers. So my district has a professional development day in the spring and teachers can submit topics that they would like to teach on for one of the sessions at like, it's like a conference style. So, you know, there's a bunch of different things to choose from each section. And I started offering cookie decorating, which sounds pretty frivolous and I don't know, funny for to to do with teachers, but it's been great. I make lots of cookies ahead of time. Sometimes the students help and bag up icing and do a demonstration and talk with the teachers. And it's a good relaxing, fun activity for them, but is a great way for me to advertise my program, talk about the significance still of FCS education, and to talk about the partnership that we have with our local career vocational school, like our career tech center. I'm actually employed by our career center, and then I just teach at a satellite campus. And so it's been a wonderful way for me to talk about that partnership and to help people better understand how my program is funded. Because I think sometimes people see our programs and think it should be the first thing on the chopping block 
when budget cuts are being made. And I think that this has been a great way to advertise the importance of my program and to really help people see into my classroom through professional development. And it has been so like loved. (laughs) It's one of the most popular sessions at that spring day. I'll do two or three sessions throughout the day. And they're always like the first ones that are filled up. And actually like our elementary school had asked if I would come and do that professional development with some of their teachers one day after school. It didn't happen because of COVID, but I'm hoping that that will be able to happen again this year. And I think you know, finding those opportunities to promote ourselves within our district are also really important because I think it's important for our administrators, but also our colleagues to understand what it is we do and that we don't just sit in our classroom all day, you know, having fun, like birthing ping pong balls and (laughs) decorating cookies, right? Like there is academic content being taught in an FCS classroom. Absolutely. Well, I love that. And I'm now even thinking, oh, I wonder if we have, so we have professional development type stuff all the time, but I'm wondering if there's a way that possibly my district, I could do a, or my a couple of my colleagues, we can do, we could put on a cookie decorating PD because what you're talking about, it, it hits the mark on everything because it's promoting our content. We're all able to kind of let our guards down and just let be creative. And we all learn better when we're actually participating and doing whatever it is. And, or how about when we're coloring or doodling? It's able to keep us engaged with listening, but also we're able to kind of focus on what we're doodling or coloring or cookie decorating. Mm -hmm. We're able to put everything down. It's able to go from our fingertips to our brains is what it is. So I love that. I remember last year, I wasn't able to participate in it, but in my Washington State Family Consumer Sciences Fall Conference, they had a cookie decorating breakout session. I wasn't able to sign up, but I was jealous as I'm watching all of these ladies have, and a couple of gentlemen have just a wonderful time doing cookie decorating. I'm like, I want to do that. Mm -hmm. And we all need a little stress relief, right? I feel like administration can easily justify something like that because they're saying that they're helping teachers with like mental health and personal, you know, well-being. Self-care, very important. I will send you the resources. I made like a little packet that I would give out at that session. So I'll make sure that I get a copy to you. It has recipes for sugar cookies, roll out sugar cookies, roll out chocolate, sugar cookies, royal icing, information about icing consistencies, and links to some of my favorite tools for cookie decorating. Yes, I would love that. And I will be sure to put that up on my website and also to connect people to you and how people can get in touch with you to say, how do you do this? How did you how did you even pitch that idea to your administration to allow you to do something like that? So that would be awesome. And I know a lot of people would really appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Do you yourself have, are you Instagram, Facebook, Twitter? What is your social media? <laughs> I have been trying to be less present on social media, but it's not that great. I'm pretty active on Facebook. Okay. People can just DM you with just searching up your name. Yes, Anna Hall. And I'm in the FCS group on Facebook, probably every FCS group. And I can give you my email too. (laughs) Yeah, no, that would be awesome. Well, this has been a joy talking with you. And holy cow, we just went through so many different content areas and getting new ideas and PD and teaching and learning. and. It's just about partnering, promoting our FCS programs is really what it is. Yes. And being there to support one another, especially us singletons that feel often like we're all alone because we are not. Yeah. No, we are not alone. You are not alone. 
just because you're a singleton, you do have, you have an army of people who are, you know, in the, at your digital fingertips to connect with. Yes. Well, thank you for having me here today. And thank you so much for this podcast. It is a wonderful resource. Yes. No, thank you for joining and we will be in touch soon. Thank you for joining me today at Connect FCS Ed. In each episode, we boldly celebrate families and careers by providing inspiration, support, and resources for teachers, students, and families. I'm inviting you to join me in the conversation. Let's share your resources and stories. Together, we are better. Thanks again for listening and helping spread the word that family and consumer sciences is today's home economics.